We are about to experience a really special session right now. Uh, we have with us Derek Yondo from the Local Soap Project. They're working with Clean the World. He, uh, you may remember GNIC has worked with very closely for very, very many years. He's going to be talking about what happens when innovation meets social entrepreneurship and recycling. Uh, the power of small ideas in the land of giants. Now, Derek grew up in a war-torn country in Africa. He was a refugee. He became an entrepreneur. And now, every day, the work that he's doing and the people that he's engaging are helping to clean the world, to make the world a better place. One of the biggest causes for preventable illnesses, especially among children, is the lack of access to clean soap, just basic sanitation. And so, I'm going to bring up Derek. Uh, he was named uh, one of CNN's top 10 heroes in 2011 to tell us more about how a personal vision and small steps and a personal journey really can change the world. Derek Kiyongo. Such a delight to be here and uh, to finally catch up with uh, the sustainable group. I'm usually speaking to other groups. But to be a man friends is uh, such a wonderful and delightful thing to do. We're going to do a couple of things today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. And then after that story, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A because I think you'll have some questions to banter with me. And then, I usually make people sing an African song, you know, like to get the food down and that kind of thing. So we'll see how that goes and see whether you guys can uh, actually play with that role. And then, I, I'm told that to, to count at all this, I'm given about five hours to do this. I'm, I'm African, what is wrong with you? So then we will close. Is that fair? Okay, very good. In 1979, my parents and I woke up to an incredible experience. We had done shit out of our apartment, and my dad looked out and saw a group of soldiers holding off our villages, fellow villages, to a roundabout station. And in Swahili, with an amalgam of Bantu languages and Arabic, the guy yelled out and said, get out of your apartments right now, get out. And he fired off a couple of rounds. And my father knew we were in big trouble at that point. And so very quickly, he says to us, let's go, because if he does come in, he'll kill us. So we get out of the apartment and go to this roundabout session where everybody had literally been gathered. This assembly was really interesting to me because at that point, a soldier World well, he walks up to a restaurant and just as such as that one, and he says to us these gothic words through a bowl. Last night, two of my soldiers were killed, and I'm here to find out who did it. So we're going to have a fire export until you tell us what happened. We were aghast at this accusation because you know that in any civilized society, when a crime of that nature is committed, that you do what? You do investigative work, you do your policy work, and you arrive at the culprit. Well, unfortunately for us, this man accused us of a crime and decided to pick up people at random. One, two, three, four, come up. And as they brought up those four, we wondered what was going on. He immediately asked us the question again, what happened last night? Who killed my two soldiers? To no avail, he pulled out his pistol, and shot off for on the spot. That immediately erupted a cacophony in between all of us as villagers because the mothers were crying, the kids were crying, all of us were at a dismay point in our lives. He picked up another four at random and as he pointed at people at four, one, two, three, four, neighbors were feeling against each other that he had picked two because they knew that they were going to be shot. So they were brought up at front by force. He asked the question again to no avail, he shot all four, that was eight. Before he could pick up another four, a young man rose up his hand and said he had committed the crime. And we all knew he was lying because we, our villages are not that big, they're small enough for you to know who is who of the village. So there's a little bit of banter going back and forth with the soldiers and this young man. And before we know it, a gunshot is uh, rings out and his brains are on the floor. I want you to take that really crazy story and back it for a second because who was Derek before that? 
Uh, I'm a young man from Uganda. Who, who knows where Uganda is? And please don't say Africa because that's the limit too. <laughs> that is pedestrian, okay? It's like we say where is Oregon and we say the United States of America. <laughs> Uganda is a small country in East Africa. We pride ourselves in being handsome and like I. <laughs> really? <laughs> like when the last time you saw a handsome Africa? Like come on. Anyway, I, I, I can't do it. But we, we are the source of the now. At least we think we are, because the Ethiopians also think they are the source of the now. But the Ethiopians are not here today. And so we are going to take Uganda for the source of the now, okay? Lake Victoria, which is shared by three countries, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, is really where the source of the now is. In fact, a part of Mahatma Gandhi's uh, ashes are dropped in the source of the now. It's a prideful place to be. We were coming out of independence and my parents were so excited at the glorious opportunity to be free from the Brits. And as we challenged ourselves into this new beautiful country that Churchill himself called the Pearl of Africa, my parents became teachers. Very quickly they realized that being a teacher doesn't pay off very well. And I don't know about American teachers and how you, might, you guys pay them, but if you get them, you don't pay them very well. So very quickly, my parents decided to shift careers and become entrepreneurs. So my father became a soap maker, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And my mother was a, a wedding gown designer. She became a seamstress. And I joke all the time that my mother never had uh, mannequins for flower gown dresses, so guess where the mannequin was? <laughs> yes, it was me. I say to people, I've been a cross-dresser since I was the age of five. <laughs> Because my mother, obviously, and you all know, mummies can be detrimental to their sons uh, as they try to make us a little bit girly. So I grew up with my colors purple, pink, and yellows, and green, so I really got into fashion with mummy. And just so you know, that was me. Uh, yeah, oh, look at that. My parents became very wealthy, and we had a little boat, and that, that's like Victoria with a little yachting uh, crew. And uh, that is mommy and daddy. Uh, my mom is one of those women that is, uh, what is that movie, the Get Crushes? What is it called? The Wedding Get Crushes, something like that? Wedding Crushes. That is my mom. She crushes people's weddings to go and tell the bride, really? You don't look that good. <laughs> and to tell the husband, wow, that suit. Talk to my son. She's that kind of girl, okay? That is my mom. And my dad over there is one of those victims that has been married to a tough woman. <laughs> and me, obviously, the child of those two characters. Uh, as Shakespeare said, we are all actors on stage, don't we? So that is mommy and daddy. But you know, here we were enjoying this beautiful country, and then everything changed. The war, which was under Idi Amin, those of you who remember First Witch in his movie, The Last King of Scotland, remember how brutal and a reprobate this man was. A character of evil, uh, Idi Amin was. And here we were in the middle of a firing squad. We then left that country to become refugees in Kenya. If you've never been to Kenya, you ought to go to Kenya. It's the land of Mufasa, huh? <laughs> the Lion King. In Kenya, my uh, father put me in the hands of an American woman from Pittsburgh. Uh, my goodness, Marge Campbell. How can I describe? Marge Campbell was from Pittsburgh. If you've never met women from Pittsburgh, you ought to meet these women. They're crazy. <laughs> As a missionary woman, she came into a bankshaw in the American way. Now remember, I'm British colonized, and here's an American who has no regard for etiquette. <laughs> At least in the way we thought of it. And so the first time I meet Marge, she offers me iced tea, and she puts it down, and I take a little test of it, and it's tea, but it's cold. So I put the glass down and she goes, what's wrong? I said, well, you forgot to cook the tea. <laughs> she said, sweetheart, that is American iced tea. You ought to love it. That's how we make tea. I said, what happened to high tea? But you know, Americans are contrarian like that, okay? They do everything that the British did reverse way. Just to tick off the British, you know? Then she offered me what you guys call cookies. Now, cookies are ridiculous. 
What happened to biscuits? You know what Americans do with biscuits? They give them to their dogs. I've been to Kroger, I see what you guys do with biscuits. That is the ultimate insult to the Brits. I mean, horrible, contrary in life. You are the people that take soccer, you know, right now we're playing football. You, who is watching the, the women's football FIFA thing? Ah, good. You know, Americans do it very well. But you know, Americans call football what? Football. And what do they do with the ball? Big man. How incommodious can that be? Carrying the ball and running with it. What happened to kicking the ball? So Mark was teaching me about American culture, and here I was watching the NFL and not watching FIFA. And then I got a chance to come to the US. Ah, America, the land of the free and the reckless. <laughs> and so I get into the US, check into a hotel, and the hotel room, this is my first time living in the hotel room. It, it, it is decked out. It is so beautiful, you know, white linens and all this. Stuff. I was like, wow, this is really good. So I go into the bathroom, and in the bathroom are three bars of soap. Fashy soap, body soap, and hand washing soap. What's the difference? None? Well, let me tell you the difference. Americans being contrarian, being funny. There's no difference, okay? So then I check into the shower, and what do they have in there? Shampoo, in case you have nappy hair like I do. Wow. So you know what? I'm the son of a man that made what? Soap. So I know a little bit about soap. So I take the two bars for the real life. But the Americans are the people that sell you ice when you live in, in Alaska and tell you you need, you need a lot of ice. You know, so I, so I take the two bars, put them in my bag for tomorrow. I come back that evening and what do you think they had done? Replace new soap. But I'm African, I will steal the heck out of that soap. So I take that two bars, steal that soap. So for three days, I am stealing the hell out of soap. But then a thought comes into my mind. I realize, you know what? They're going to charge me for the soap, aren't they? Because Americans are contrarian like that. There's no free lunch in where? In America, okay? So I take all the little stolen goods downstairs to the concierge. The concierge was an American man, an African American man. If you've never met African Americans, you ought to meet them. They're crazy. Unbelievable people. My only experience with African Americans was through the movie Coming to America. Remember Eddie Murphy? <laughs> Eddie Murphy is the best African American man in the world. Okay? That is a funny brother right there. And so I was dying to, you know, say my yo, what's up, man? You know? Like I'm dying. So I have my books. I walk up to him and I say, hey, my brother, I've been stealing your soap. He says, what? <laughs> Like from housekeeping? I said, no, 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 no. You keep on bringing me soap, and I keep on stealing it, but I can't afford it. So please take it back to housekeeping. Tell them not to charge me for it, because I can't afford it. He burst out laughing. And when an African American laughs, that's a lot of laughter. He's like, man, are you African, man? Because, you know, that actually came out, you know, are you African? Are you Nigerian? Because we're all Nigerians, you yeah? <laughs> I mean, we're the one that sent you that email that says, my father just passed away, he left me with a billion dollars, give me your account, that shows And you know what, Americans really are contrarian like that, they will give you their account. So we laughed and banter back and forth, and I said to him, no, I'm not Nigerian, but I'm Ghanaian. No, I'm Ugandan. And we say, I said to him, but uh, what do you do with the passion is about so? This is like the one you leave behind. I said, yeah, the one you leave behind. Can I have that? He says, oh, yeah, you can have that. But I said, if somebody doesn't take it, whatever. He says, we throw those out. And I said, what? I said, he says, we throw those out. I said, we want to use He says, yes. And so all of a sudden, I'm with a man here that has brought my whole life crushing down. I go back to my room and I lose it. Because for the first time now, I realize the epiphany in my life the Eureka moment has happened. Remember, I am the child of the man that did what? Made soap. 
Then I met an American woman, Marge, and through her and other people, I come to the US to go to school. And now I'm seeing a little boy. So big through the way. But in the middle of that, I'm a former refugee that saw the power and the need for soap. I don't know whether you know this, but women, you should listen to this. Most women around the world, the idea of hygiene is so powerful. It's where a mother, for example, is giving back in a refugee camp and has no water, clean water, or soap, or gloves, and the midwife goes to deliver a child, and they leave a germ in her womb, and in two weeks she's dead because of childbed fever. That's the power of soap. And kids just not having the ability to be at school every day because they are always constantly victims of hygiene, poor hygiene. And so, very soon, I realized that, you know what? Americans throw away 800 million bars of soap every year. American hotels do. That is about what? 2.6 million bars of soap every single day. That is a powerful thing to discover. And so I go about to found the Global Soap Project. And of course, finished to go to school and that kind of thing. My dad said, you gotta finish school, okay? So I finished school and found this organization. I'm gonna walk you through the, the way we recycle soap and how we didn't deliver this particular powerful product to a mother in Africa, a mother in Latin America, and where else we are, I think South Asia and all those beautiful places. The question is, how do you recycle soap? The first time I recycled soap was in my basement, which is where all American businesses begin and fail. <laughs> I also introduced the idea to an American woman called Vicky Gordon, who was the former EVP for the Intercontinental Hotel Group. Because in business, you have to know what? You have to do some power network, not just networking, but power networking. So I go to Starbucks, which is where every American business also begins, and drew the idea on an upkeep. And she said, so, I'll take it. And so we started to recruit hotels in Barclay, which is right here. The first hotel that gave us soap was the Intercontinental in Barclay. So I carried the first bars of soap to my basement, and I go to Home Depot, buy a big crock pot, melt the soap down, pour it into little PCV pipes, and think that tomorrow it's going to thaw, and I'm going to have a what? A full bar of soap. I do that, go back to my board with a little bar of soap, and I think to them, I said to them, I have recycled soap. After two weeks, that big bar of soap that I gave them had shrunk to a penny. My first fail, small ideas and hard work, this is my giants. But figured out that process very quickly, that here, here what, what is what happens. The soap comes into a factory, and we peel it, this was the first day, with potato peelers. I had the largest collection of potato peelers in the whole world. <laughs> but now, of course, we're much more advanced. We peel the soap after we sort it by color. It is then put into a machine, crushed into a powder. That is like a laundry detergent powder. Then we turn that into a Ziploc sort of a, a, a batch. And at that point, we're suffocating and, you know, giving the jumps a hard time because they ain't there dancing and co-creating and loving and so on. No, vacuum, okay? So we put them in a vacuum. After that, we are waking the soap after we have that wicked soap or so, and we add a little bit of moisture. We then turn it into a thicker cheese texture. That is what we put into a machine, and it warms it up, and out comes a full bar of soap, which looks like that. Those are University of Michigan students. Uh, that's one day of work of soap that would have been thrown away. This is brand new soap. We then put it into batches. Oh, that's me trying to sort of style. Remember to talk about style? <laughs> so put it in a box, batch it in a batch, and then that batch, we take about six bars randomly to Ohio. What is in Ohio? Fort Camp Gambo. Ah, the largest place. They have big labs there. We test for pathogens, 12 pathogens, to make sure that the soap is what? Clean and then we ship to Africa, or Latin America. What do American mothers say when you give them a gift? Thank you. Thank you. Very standard. Thank you. What do you think an African mother says or a Latina mother says? 
Gracias. No. <risa> I mean, we cry, we dance, we laugh. My God, there's nothing as powerful as taking a, a, a gift that has been given by your fellow human beings on this side of the waters. And you take that bar of soap and it's a soap of hope and you clean your child with it. That's what we've been able to do with the Glow Soap Project. We're now in 92 countries around the world in terms of supply and demand and supply and giving soap away. 92 countries. We are invested in two premises. One is that the environment is very, very important. But we just, it's not enough to tell people that the environment is important to them. We have to give real sustainable ideas of how to actually clean the environment. And this is one clear way of doing that. We haven't even talked about the, the, the little bottles, the shampoo bottles, and the contents within. So Global Soap and Clean the World are partnered to do this remarkable work of taking soap from the hotels. Rather than critique the hotels and go against them, we are working with them. That is how we're going to clean our environment, by developing cahoots and partnerships that actually work. Lastly, the premise that we have is that it has to have a good people ending story. Who is benefiting from this particular environmental premise? It's not just animals, it's human beings. When you are making a dollar a day, and you have to actually take 25 cents to 50 cents to buy a bar of salt, chances are you're not going to do that because you haven't eaten yet. And so as we provide these really, really practical ideas to solve people's problems globally, we are also naturally the idea that innovation is part of the way you do business in solving global problems. Benjamin Franklin knew this. And so I am happy to say to you in conclusion that I have enjoyed very much this idea of coming to this country and being part of what Ellis Island represents. This ability to come in here and not sit on your laws, but to actually create, not to complain, but to innovate, not to say I am weak, but to be strong, not to say that I'm unable, but to be able. These are the premises under which this country was constructed. This is a Jeffersonian idea. It's who we are, because now I'm an, I'm an American. I'm not the British, just a suit. And so I will end here and challenge you that as you do your work in sustainable work and development, do it with the idea of knowing that innovation doesn't end. It is a continuum that we have to invest in. Thank you very much. some Q&A and ask me some tough questions. I think we have a Robin mic. Don't be nice to me, okay? Be really tough. Yes, ma'am. So, how do you make the money, how, how do you come about the money to, uh, because obviously you're giving the product away for free, it's not a business. So how do you raise the money to do that? How do you make the money to pay for the the, the maintenance of the how do you raise the money to pay for the manufacturing or remanufacturing and the shipping to P and G, and then shipping over to. Do you have other partners? Are they all helping you for free? Yes. Um, first of all, I think that one of the most beautiful things is that the hotels, at the end of the day, have understood the work we're doing, and now they actually chip in. Uh, they do give us a little bit of money for every time we take the bus to some way. That's number one. Of course, we have donors as well who are working with us, but we've also invested in this particular notion that we are going to take some of the soap that we make. There are other small communities that are not so wealthy, but they can afford a little bit of salt. So we sell it to India a little bit, and then some of those communities underwrite the producing and manufacturing work and giving away of free salt. But we also started a new uh, concept called the microfinancing of salt. So we'll give a mother in Africa a box of salt. She'll take that salt and sell it on the market and make a little bit of money, and then she'll start to do it, come back and buy more and sell it to market, and then that will diversify her portfolio of commodities that she's selling. So we are empowering the women back at home by giving them a real reason for them to get into business and become entrepreneurs. I don't really like the idea of begging. I just don't think it's sustainable. Uh, I think you have to move away from that. 
but the hotels have been very, very understanding and accommodating, and I've been working with us. The first money that I got to build the factory was from the Newton Corporation. They gave me $1.3 million to build the factory. And their whole idea at this was that if we can actually throw this sofa away into the environment, and we don't get any returns back, if we gave you $1.3 million, uh, million, you can actually take the sofa out of the environment, and you can give us a good message for us to give out there. So the Venetian, uh, people like Jenny are here, these are our partners, and that's how we've been able to sustain the thing. Lastly, you don't have to use money all the time to do work and good work. Partnerships are important. So for example, I'll show you a photograph really, oh, it's good. We are, we're, we're next to country, but we're partnering with the Center for Disease Control, I guess, we're with the CDC. They're one of our, 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 our partners. They have boots on the ground. So I don't have to open offices in every little uh, community around the world. K International, World Vision, Partners in Health, UNICEF, all these are groups that we're working with to actually get the soft delivered and delivered in time. No, we don't package. Yeah, I knew that was coming. Ha, I don't package. <laughs> I'm one of you! Come on! Any other questions? Oh, right here. How many people would you estimate you're able to help a course the, across the course of a year? How many people are we able to help uh, in terms of estimation? I, don't, I can't really give a real estimation, but I can, give, I can tell you this. We have an example in Malawi where we had a village of about 20,000 people. The infection rates of diarrhea were 90%. When we got there and taught them how to use soap and the power of soap, we reduced that to about 2% infection rate. That was in partnership with what? The Center for Disease Control. So I think that there is a lot of uh, ways that we can do this mitigation and I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We just now worked with a, a young lady from Emory University who has given us uh, uh, her expertise. She went to a Latin American country, I think it's Ecuador or Colombia, where she was looking at the impact of soap in schools, in primary schools. And so we put the bar of soap, the first time we put it in the, in the schools, the kids would steal the soap and take it back home. So now we put it in a net tied next to the top where they have to open it, and they, they wash their hands and then they leave the soap behind and they can actually help. That is really, really doing very well. Uh, I think that the power of this is going to be as we work with organizations like CARE and Senior for Disease Control, they have what they call wash programs, water and sanitation and hygiene programs. So this is not an isolation of clean water, for example. Yeah? Some people ask me, how do you give people soap and then they have dirty water? Well, the programs that we're working with have clean water already, so that that solves the whole holistic problem of hygiene. Does that make sense? So yeah, that's what, that's what we're looking at. Yes. Targeting specific, you know, really desperate regions, or are you pretty much broad? Are you going at a certain pace? You, know, you have a you have a plan of how you're rolling out certain things. Yes, we do have a plan, and the, 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 the plan initially was that we were going to work with African countries, but then natural disasters do happen. We have human-made disasters, but also we have natural disasters. So you guys remember the, the earthquake in Haiti? We had just started our programming. And just as I was taking so to Africa, the Haitian problem became very gargantuan. And so in trying to turn and focus on Haiti, that became our primary focus. So we're usually driven by that. The recent uh, drive was Ebola. You guys remember Ebola? That was huge. It was really a hygiene problem for the most part. Cultural but also hygiene. So by taking soap and giving them soap and showing them that you can't touch people and then not wash your hands, this has been very helpful. That has been a, part, a big part of our work. Uh, what we're looking at right now, so we have the humanitarian disaster approach, then we have the community approach, and then we have the microfinance economic sort of approach. So it's three tier in that way. But also, it's not about just victims, it's also about us here in the West and how we view the power of these things that we have. When you look at this country, we throw away a lot. So it's not enough for us to just say, well, they need this, and we don't need it. No, we also need to take it out of the environment and clean our environment. So there's a side to the side, which is cleaning the environment and taking the stuff out of the environment, which is, I think, very, very helpful. <coughs> yes, ma'am. What are some of the benefits that you're finding of now partnering with Clean the World? What are some of the benefits of partnering with Clean the World? Well, like in everything, uh, you have a... a I think other guys that merges, they're always cultural. It's like going from one tribe to another, yeah? 
But the beauty about it is that we, are, we share one common goal, and that is to collect the soap out of the hotels, clean it, and give it to poor people around the world. What Clean the World does, or what they're going to do, is the manufacturing part of it. They're getting the hotels registered, the manufacturing of the soap and the technology there. They, what Global Soap is good at, which is what I'm also very good at, because I worked for care for about 10 years. So I, I worked for Amnesty for three years. I'm very much into the nonprofit world, and I understand the value proposition on the ground. So it is to bring that soap into the community with respect and dignity. Because a lot of aid comes to Africa, it comes to Haiti, it comes to, with disrespect. And so you see Africans fighting for food, for example, and you're like, oh my goodness, why are they fighting? That is disrespectful order of aid. So my job is to show how we can actually take a product from the US, bring it to these communities with respect. Some communities, for example, don't like the color white. So when you give them white salt, the mother's like, mm, I don't like that. What do you do with that? You give them blue. We have the luxury to program on the ground with effect. But also, I understand that NGO community, Clean the World did not. So we do understand the community because I work in the community. So that partnership where they understand the business side, and we understand the programming side, together we are a force to work on. Uh, very good. So we have the U.S., which is kind of the mecca of uh, soap. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say this, Jenny, don't be mad, but my son calls the soap from Las Vegas sin soap. <laughs> A lot of Americans go to sin in Vegas, but... We have Disney, Vegas, then we have Hong Kong, we have a little bit of China, we're now opening up in Italy as well, for the European US. So those will be market places for us to grow. It's very hard for us to, uh, and Japan is one that we've looked at as well. So our goal, my idea was that we get the Asian soap to service the Asian continent, the American soap to service the South American continent, and North American continent, and then the European continent to service Africa because of distance. So demographically, we actually closer to those things than, than we were before. What has been helpful is that we've realized that the transportation of soap from the U.S. to these remote areas in the global south is very easy. At first I thought, oh, I was going to transport, this is going to be costly. But by partnering with people like CARE, they already have containers moving aid. So they always have room to transport the soap. So we're not actually putting the bill for transportation. We're sort of like a soap depot. We have these organizations come and source soap and take it to the victim areas. So that's how we're doing it. So Asia, Europe, the U.S., at three cor corridors of silos through which the soap is being uh, donated. Over here. Yeah, I was wondering, how, what is the best way for the meeting planners around here to be taking up collections at their events to get you soap, and for the hoteliers or the destination management companies or people on the supply side to be able to take up collections and, and donate it to the Global Soap We have many people here. <laughs> <laughs> this is good news. <laughs> oh, what a secret. <laughs> How many of you are in the meeting and events planning? <laughs> Gold mine! Okay, so the question is how do we get you guys involved? Here's how you do it. When you go to get your events planned, you approach a hotel, like Jenny's Hotel. The best way is to ask the hotel to start recycling, to enter a program. The one of thing doesn't work, and you all know that that's a kind of a not a way to, to do sustainable work. Get the hotels to actually buy into the whole process. Because some of the hotels are franchise hotels. So Jenny can, Jenny can give a directive down to all the hotels, but the franchisee have to determine to actually do the work. So it's not her responsibility per se. It is the owners of the hotels that are franchise hotels that actually make the, the, the decision to do the work. And it has worked very well. I remember there's a hotel, there's a JW Marriott in San Antonio. And they had about 300 employees in the housekeeping department. They are the most underappreciated people, by the way, in the hotel business. Can we, can we be fair? <laughs> and so the power mapping here was not necessarily the owner of the hotel, as it was those women. And when I told them the story of where the soap was going to go, it turned out that most of them are from other parts of the world. 
the Latinas, the Eastern Europeans, the Africans, the tears we cry together are the same tears we cry with the, when I'm giving the soap with the mamas. The intersection there worked beautifully. So talk to the hotels about that power that they have to change that woman's life in Africa but also in the housekeeping department. They feel so appreciative to know that their work now has value. So that's how you get the hotels to buy into it. And then they will collect the soaps and give them to us on a regular basis. In fact, this hotel is one of the hotels that gives us soap. And they were one of the early ones to give us soap. So the director of housekeeping here at one point was a Caribbean man. And so he understood the value. So the hotels really do understand the value of this. And that's how you do it. Secondly, you've got to have me come to the event to speak. <laughs> yes. I'm American now, so I'm really good at self-promotion. <laughs> well, one question for a customer right now. Well, okay. Okay. But um, how important was CNN's uh, hero, hero for the Planet Award to you in your, in your efforts? So let's bifurcate that into two pieces. This CNN hero event, Derek, in the CNN hero event, Global Soft, which is really two things that I want to share with you because this is fun. You guys are fun groups, so I can really be a little bit intimate. You know how you see the Amy's and people are coming with their beautiful, they are clad to the nines. I've always wanted to do that. And I didn't know how to do that. And I didn't know that I was going to get that through Global Soft. So the first time I got there, the, 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 the front seat, they had names of everybody who was going to sit next to me and my family. Jerry Seinfeld was sitting next to my son. Chaka Khan was right behind us. Myra Cyrus was next to my daughter. My daughter was like this. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, close your mouth. <laughs> no, closer. Don't make it wider. It was unbelievable. So that part of it was really a wonderful thing. But what it did for us at Global Soul on this end was it took what is supposed to be a simple, silly idea and blew it up into a noble idea that we are all dying to hear about. You know, when is the last time you had an American story that comes from the innate value of war, comes to the US, does something with the story, and builds an organization that is global? That is such a breath of fresh air for all of us, because sometimes Americans become uh, apath apathy-driven. You know? we, we don't think our country is good enough, or we're doing horrible things around the world. Maybe we are, but you know what? We are also doing very beautiful things around the world. And we don't really sit down and take time to celebrate those things. So when I'm communicating to people like you, I tell Americans, my fellow Americans, take time to really breathe in and see the incredible work that is being done globally through our work as Americans. And that's one of the beautiful things. When I go back home and I say, I'm, I'm an American now and I've got you so many things, we balance, we don't fight. So that is what CNN Heroes did for me. It glorified good work. And that's what we need sometimes. We see so much, so many bad stories on TV. This was a good one. <laughs> you are such a gifted speaker. I wonder, do you have your story in video format that it could be shared and populated with some of the venues that could contribute to your calls and maybe get you there after we got some support of knowing your story? I planted that question. <laughs> yes, uh, I did a TED talk that I think most of you can Google. And it's a great TED talk out of Charleston, which was really fantastic. It's a 15 minute sort of 14 minute TED talk thing. Uh, the story is a larger story. I don't have a chance to sort of tell the full story. But I think that gives you the compendium of it all. And I think you can distribute that and give it up uh, to those who are looking for it. But uh, I think that the beauty about the story and capturing it is that every day the story changes. So what it was before, you know, when Jenny and you and I met, uh, it has changed now from my basement to now being in, in, in Hong Kong and to see mothers, you know, dancing around the world. I think that it is a human story that talks about the earth as we know it and its struggle to survive and be healthy. And I tell people that when you're in the business of giving life to an entity that gives you life in the first place, you're in a good place. And so that's the beauty about this, this particular work, and I hope you can populate that.
that out there. That would be great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I hope that's thank you. I may have just been watching the Twitter stream that uh, I was not the only person that found inspiration in what he was talking about. There are a couple of things that when Derek was talking about his story that kind of resonated and reminded me of some things that have been dolphining up his themes throughout the conference already. And one of them is uh, what's personal. You know, yesterday we heard uh, Laura Turner Seidel talk about how her father couldn't leave trash that people had left behind there. He taught his children that you know, even if you don't make the mess, you're responsible for cleaning up other people's messes. And it affected how she then went on to affect things in a professional way. And Derek being the son of a soap maker and then seeing how soap was being wasted kind of sparked this passion to fix it and to find a solution. And when we create change, it doesn't start off as this big audacious idea. We find these big audacious ideas that change the world in very prosaic moments. Taking a shower, walking down the street, listening to a conversation, rolling your eyes at something. These are the ways in which we start to figure out what path or what journey we're supposed to be on. And that in itself is what leads to change. So we are now going to adjourn here and go up to learn about some of the nuts and bolts, some of the tools you might need to affect this change. But I want you to continue to think about what in your life, what personal areas are things that, you know, they talk about comedians, they, they're always driven by an anger, by a rage, by a, you know, writers write about what they know. Your purpose for being here isn't something that you need to stumble upon, it's something that's already inside you. And at some point it'll become clear to you. And so enjoy your sessions from 2 to 2, 2 to 3.30 about, you know, there's one-on-one -on, -one on the standard, so if you don't know the basics, you can go and you can learn those. If you already know the basics, there's another option that's a little bit higher level, which is talking about the tech tools and tips. But in your conversations, as you're processing what you've been gathering, start to think about what it is personally, like where does it resonate to you the most? Because I think that's where you're gonna start to find your passion and your pathway. And then you'll come back here at four o'clock and we'll learn how to share those successes and share those stories. So if you already are very active in transforming things and making things happen, you understand how important it is, to use a couple of Southern expressions, not to hide your fire under a bushel and to understand that it ain't bragging it's true. <laughs>